Good morning, everybody. Maybe I say buongiorno. Buongiorno. Okay. Now, I was told when we first started talking about whether I was going to give a talk or not, that I was supposed to talk about my life, my experiences, my journey of life. But I prefer to say the faith of my journey of life. Because without my faith, my life is pretty boring. And, and I don't want anybody going to sleep on me, okay? Uh, but without the goodness of God, my life is very mundane. And I see my life completely inundated with the goodness of God. Uh, so much so that you'll probably hear me say the phrase a lot of times in here, God is good. And we can use that several ways. But what I'd like for you to do today, when I, you hear me say, God is good, I want you to respond, always was and always will be. Can we do that? God is good. Always was and always will be. There you go. Now that's, that's to give praise to God and it's to keep you awake. Okay? All right. Um... I had a, a priest that taught me systematic theology in the diaconate, uh, the late uh, Father John Bagel, uh, Marianist from Dayton. And every time he would walk into the classroom, he would take off his coat and he would say, hold on to your hat, here we go. All right, so hold on to your hat, here we go. To fully understand what God has done for me, I do think we need to share with you my heritage because it built on my life. Or I, my life is built on that. Now, I'm the last of 11 children. I've had an immigrant Italian father and a third generation German mother. Dad was born in 1883. Uh, to Eugenio and Asunta Galoni, the seventh of eight children, and the family was very poor, living in a small house in the valley between the village of Lopia and, and the town of Barga in Tuscany, in Italy. And I never f knew much about Dad's background uh, when he came to this country. He and his other brothers came in the late 1890s. Well, there was, where they lived was uh, uh, this little house down the valley. And first time I went there, I wrote back home and I told mom and dad that I found the house that dad was born in. Now this is back in the mid 50s. And uh, mom wrote back and says, daddy says, you couldn't have found it, it's too remote. Well, the soldier that was with me, when we went down for the first time, he had a telescopic lens on his camera and he took a picture. So I sent that picture home and dad confirmed right away, that's it. So the thing was, we couldn't get to it. There's no roads to the house, it says clear down the valley. If you're looking at it from up on the, the road, the present road now, it, looks like a little toy house down there. It's that far away. So I'm not a good judge, but probably a couple miles, three miles maybe. And because um, there's days that you can't see it. The, the clouds are down over the top. But anyway, um, the stories I'm telling you about here was told to me by a first cousin when I was there for the first time. There's no roads to this house. And it sets about three miles down the valley from the nearest church up in Barga. And um, Sundays and Holy Days, they walk to church every day. They have to walk through the woods, through the valleys, and go to church. But the problem was they couldn't all go together. They were so poor that they did not have enough shoes to go around. Now, there's uh, 
10 of them in the family, they had five pair of shoes, one for every two kids that are, and mom and dad, grandma and grandpa. So half of them would go to church, come back, take their shoes off, give the other half, and they would walk to church and go to mass. But they never missed. They always went. They always went to church because faith was their main thing. Their diet for the week or for the days was polenta, cornmeal mush, and bread, and the vegetables they grew in their own garden. Grandpa was a farmer, and my dad, along with his four brothers, would go out and collect wood in the woods and take it into town and sell it. They said that the only time they had meat was on Christmas and Easter. At the age of eight, now dad was the next to the youngest, at the age of eight, he left home with the blessings of grandma and grandpa. And a friend of his was 14 years old and his name was Enzio. And they got on a boat and worked their way across to England to make a living for themselves and to send money back for the family. Well, after a year of starving, they decided it wasn't gonna work. They worked their way back on a boat and came back home. So dad's now nine years old. At the age of 14, he and his four brothers got on a boat for the United States. Uh, Enzio, I met him when I first got there in the mid-50s, and uh, he was coming in from the uh, fields, and he's just a little old Italian, about this big, like a skinny as could be, and he had this sickle over his, over his shoulder from cutting down wheat. And I got to talk to him through an interpreter. And uh, he told me all about the story of Dad and him and uh, how, how it all came about. So I'm, I'm getting this, the story of, of my heritage from Dad, of Dad, uh, uh, firsthand. Well, they came across from England, got off at Ellis Island, and in 1904, ended up in Newark by the way of Boston, Chicago, Columbus, and then into Newark. And this country that they came to, America, it, it did not disappoint them. It supported them. It supported their families. Now, my one, one uncle, he went back to Italy, but that was his... A choice when he came over here because he was already married and he came here to make a, a fortune. Okay, but one thing about dad, uh, he was a humble, hardworking, God-loving man of deep faith and all of his life he would say, God is good. Mom was the middle of her 13 siblings and she made it to the fourth grade. Dad never did go to school, by the way. She made it to the fourth grade before she had to quit to help Grandma with the raising of her younger siblings and to do housework for others to make some money to support the family. Now, my grandfather I never knew. He died before, right, the year before I was born. And he was a glass blower, had a good job at Heise, but uh, he also had a problem. Every Friday after work, they would get their paycheck, and he would stop to have a beer. By the time he got home that weekend, he had no money to give to Grandma. The only thing the family lived on was what she made doing ironings and washing for other people and doing housework, and like Mom and her sisters would go out and do housework for people. So uh, Mom grew up in the alcoholic, an abusive home, and she brought that mentality to her family. Her family of origin was faith-filled, though. They always went to church. They were good, hard-working people. And Mom married at a very young age, but her first husband was killed when he was 19 years old in an industrial accident up in Pittsburgh. And Mom was uh, expecting her third child, my oldest sister. So, uh, she came back to Newark, where Grandma was, 
and uh, she met Pop. They were married. They had eight more children. I'm the last of them, so here I am. Through all of this, my mom and dad did instill in each of the children the Catholic faith and all that it entailed, every bit of it. Uh, I, I am proud to say that, well, there's only four of us living right now, uh, and uh, all 11 of us stayed true to the Catholic faith. My oldest brother, uh, God rest his soul, uh, ended up being an alcoholic too. And I think he was the only one that ever missed Mass. And uh, it was, but he, God stepped in, gave him a good wife who was not Catholic, but she made sure that the two children they had were raised Catholic. And she would go to church with them, take them back home on Sunday, and then go back into town and go to the Methodist church herself. As I grew up, and now in my later years, on having been able to return to my roots in Italy several times, I'm able to look back and reminisce on my life. I see what I took from each one of my parents and what I left behind. I believe, and I hope I'm right, that I did take at least the humility of my dad and the work ethics that both mom and dad shared along with dedication to family and their dedication to God and the Catholic faith. Been very blessed all through my life. My sisters would say that I was spoiled, but I correct them every time. And I say, I'm loved. I was loved. I was never spoiled. So why do I share this with all of you today? Well, let me read from a book by Pope Francis. It's titled uh, Walking with Jesus. Uh, is taken from his encyclical Lumen Fidei. But he says, I'm going to read here. He says, those who have opened their hearts to God's love, heard his voice, and received his light, light cannot keep this gift to themselves, because faith is hearing and seeing. It is also handed on as word and light. Addressing the Corinthians, St. Paul used these very images. On the one hand, he says, but just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with scriptures, I believe and so I speak. We also believe and so we speak. The words once accepted becomes a response, a confession of faith which spreads to others and invites them to believe. And that's what I would like to do today. I believe, and so I speak. I pray you hear and you see and believe what God has intended for you and me today. So I reflect back as far as I can remember. The important events, the important periods of my life are all centered on my faith, and in particular on the sacraments that I received and graces God gave me to carry out his mission for him in this life. Of course, for me being baptized one week after I was born in 1939, I do not remember what happened to me then, but my later reflections on the graces God gives to us in baptism, I can see where, yes, those graces are important at a young age because they flow they flow from that early age, and it benefits our life with God. Mom and Dad showed me faith not only by textbook or, or only words, but mostly by their actions. They were faith-filled, committed to God in attending Mass. I don't ever remember Mom and Dad missing a Mass. Receiving Holy Communion, reconciliation every Saturday, and obeying the Lord in the loss of the church. We prayed the family rosary every single night before going to bed. I remember when I was wee little, before I went to school, being the last of 11, the others were gone. They were four brothers in World War II. The others in school were married 
and I was the last at home and mom wanted a break. Dad delivering produce in a truck all around Ohio, central Ohio, and I would get in the truck with him. Well, the first thing he did when he got in the truck and put it in gear, he would take out of his pocket his rosary. And he prayed that rosary until we got to the next stop. When we got to the next stop, he put the rosary on the seat, and we'd go in and do our business. He'd come back out, pick up the rosary, and start praying again. And he did that all day long. Mom continually prayed for four sons, my brothers, who were in World War II to bring them home safe. And God did it. I grew in my own faith by recognition of their actions. And it was instrumental as I grew up into a young person. They proved to me that God is good. As I entered grade school and into the second grade, um, First Confession, First Holy Communion was the highlight of that year. And having the Dominican nuns teach me for 12 years was a real blessing in itself. I can still remember both of these events as if they were yesterday. I remember Sister Mary Helen preparing us for First uh, Reconciliation, Confession at that time, they called it. And uh, I remember leading up to that day, uh, Father Crosser was the pastor, and she wanted to make sure everything was right with us going in. And she always told us these sins that we could have committed. And they were disobeying parents, fighting with your brothers and sisters, taking something that didn't belong to you, telling a little white lie, all right? And every day we got the same, same teaching, these four, five sins that we had to do. Well, the reason I, I remember that so well is that at that young age, I thought she was telling us that we had to tell those sins every time we went in. So for a year or two, I told that sin every time I went to confession on Saturday afternoon, although I didn't commit them. So, but that was fun. Uh, it was just good. Uh, my first Holy Communion was extraordinary for me. Uh, I truly felt the presence of God coming into my heart and soul. I can still remember receiving the Eucharist. I can tell you what I wore that day. I can tell you that when I came in back, I put my head down and I prayed to God like I was just talking to him at that eight, at eight years old, nine years old, whatever I was. But it was there. And it's still to this day, every time I receive the Eucharist, I know that God has come into my heart and he's going to stay there until I kick him out with my sinfulness. From the time I was in the fourth grade, I began to serve at the altar for mass, learning my Latin responses. Back then, it took a year of training before they allowed you to be on the altar. And then that, five, well, it was nine months and then three months with a high school older server, and then you could serve by yourself. Um, then came confirmation with Bishop Hedinger. Now, that was an experience in itself. And it was so instrumental in my life, I need to go into detail with it. It's not as positive as what you might think. I don't remember the question that was asked by the bishop, but I know I raised my hand, and I know he called on me, and I quoted scripture, and I can tell you what the, I don't know what the question was, and I can tell you the answer. I quoted scripture by saying, God says, he that is first will be last, and he that is last will be first. And Bishop Hedinger stepped back, and he says, well, he says, that's right, but that's not the answer I was thinking about. And I thought to myself, okay, at least I'm half right. I got the right without right, but he wanted something else. So I was okay with that. Confirmation went on, and I felt really good leaving church. When I got home, my sisters and my mother had prepared a family gathering at the, at the house. So we're there having mom, I'm sure, fix something to eat. I don't really remember. But the telephone rang. And my sister went over and answered it. They called me Robert back then. She says, Robert, this phone calls for you. I went over and she was watching me. I went over and took the phone and I said, hello. And on the other end, this voice says, this is Bishop Hedinger. 
how dumb can you be to give me an answer like that to my question at confirmation? And I was dumbfounded. I was devastated. And I started crying. This is very vivid in my mind. And as I cried, everybody's going, what's wrong, what's wrong? Except my one sister, they answered the phone and she was laughing. Well, she was laughing because it was her husband on the other end of the line. <laughs> it does, it does sound funny, but I'm going to tell you, although I know God gave me the gifts of the Holy Spirit in my confirmation, I did not allow the Spirit to enter into my life for decades to come. I never left God or his church. I always went to Mass, I always went to church. But I never left the Holy Spirit in my life. But when I finally realized how I reacted to the Lord from the annex of this human being, I had a lot of soul searching to do and reconciliation to be had. I was what, 13, 14 years old? Uh, 52, 1952. It wasn't until the 1990s that I let the Holy Spirit into my life. Was God there? Absolutely. God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was there. But I didn't let the Holy Spirit in my life. I didn't hear one word from me. Although I had an inclination beforehand to the vocation of the priesthood, it began to waver. And by the time I entered into high school, this inclination went by the wayside. But God was there for me. If I did have a calling by God, I didn't receive that call into my heart. But he did not abandon me. I have come to believe, as a reflection on my life, that God does not allow us to be alone. And if we don't see the road he wants us to travel, then he places a detour in front of us to bring us back around. After many years or miles we've traveled in our lives. Now this is only part of my journey that I chose a fork in the road of life. Some were right turns, some were left turns, and actually they, some of them were the right turns. He has placed many road signs ahead of me that I ignored in life, but I can now find the signs of those detours of the Lord in my past life also especially from my high school days to the present. God has worked diligently in my life to get me where I am today. From the time I started to serve on the altar at Mass in the fourth grade until the present, I've been an assisting minister for God's representative, the priest, at the Mass. From serving at the altar at Blessed Sacrament Clear through my army days, I served every Sunday for the chaplain and my adult serving, serving when I came back to lector and EM after Vatican II and now to being a deacon. From romances to marriage to the cult of fatherhood, raising children, trying to be his inspiration to others in life, I have tried to remain faithful to God's call. Now, I'm going to make a statement here that I'm going to contradict myself in a little bit. I do not remember ever telling the Lord no. And you'll see what I mean in a little bit. Or to having any determinant of faith. I have been blessed in so many ways in life, even to the point of being in the minority of the men in the church that have been truly blessed with the reception of all seven sacraments. God is really good. He's been good. In 1960, 
he re redirected me from one marriage proposal to another. And in 1963, Barb and I were married. Uh, in this alone, I found I was being called to stand up for God and his church. When I approached Barb's parents to ask to marry her, their daughter, I was confronted with a very anti-Catholic attitude from my future mother-in-law, something I was not expecting at all. The first thing she brought up was, we could get married, but not in the Catholic Church, and certainly any grandchildren that I have will not be Catholic. They're not to be baptized. Well, without hesitation, the Lord stepped in, and the words out of my mouth were both calm and sincere, and I rebuked her wishes. Eventually, she signed the papers at church one day before our wedding, because Barb was under 21 at the time, and the law required parental consent for minors, and she waited till the last minute, but we were married with her blessing in St. Francis de Sales Church, with Monsignor Mattingly, who's buried right out here, uh, a celebrant. So all of our three children were baptized and raised Catholic. In the end, when the kids were baptized and when they had special events in the church, my mother-in-law and my father-in-law attended. And eventually they came even at times for Sunday mass when something was going on. My goal in life was never to be rich, but to be able to sustain a lifestyle that benefited my family. And I always wanted to have enough money back so that in retirement, Barb and I could do some traveling. Well, God certainly answered that first part. I was never rich. And, <laughs> and certainly not today. But we never wanted or needed anything. And that was God provided for us all the way through. My mother-in-law, when I did ask her, she wanted to know, well, how are you going to support my daughter? Because I hadn't been to college. And she says, she'll never have a home of her own. And I just looked at her and I says, within five years we'll be in a brand new house. And she laughed at me. And she shouldn't have done that because in four years and eight months, we moved into a new house that we lived in for over 50 years before we sold it four years ago. God even provided me information on being a travel guide by way of conversation and so to speak. And, and it allowed me to make many trips back to my father's home in Italy. God's provided me to be heir I've been back 26 times. Uh, they're done and gone now, but, uh, and Barb, when she was able to travel, was able to go with me all the time. So now maybe you can see a little bit of how God has been good to me in life. Okay. You're still awake, thank you. In 1993, Blessed Sacrament had a week-long retreat with Father Huntsinger and, and a Dominican nun, Sister Maureen. Do you know Sister Marine, Father? No. Uh, I have no idea what they said that time, that week. I don't, don't, have, I don't even know what the topic was. But God touched me with his Holy Spirit, and I heard it for the first time in 40 years. It was, I recognized that the Holy Spirit was talking to me and telling me that he needed me. I left the church that last night of the retreat telling Barb that God is calling me to do something, but I have no idea what it is. Now here's where I have to put in a contradiction of my first statement that I never said no to God. Anybody here remember Deacon Charlie Stevens? Yeah, yeah. He was one of the first deacons, wasn't the first, but one of the first deacons of the Diocese of Columbus, and he was from Blessed Sacrament, a dear friend. And he is what a deacon should be in all aspects of life. He, he was the deacon deacon, okay? Well, early on, 
in his ministry as deacon, he would periodically call me to the diaconate. And my answer was always no. See, God speaks to us and through other people. He persisted for about 10 years, at least a couple times a year. He would come and say, you know, you know, you got to look into the deacon. No, Charlie, I'm not going to be a deacon. My goal in life is to raise my family, have enough money to travel. I'm not going to have time for ministry. Well, that very weekend in the Catholic Times, after the chrism program, or, uh, after I'd uh, come away from that retreat, was an article about the chrism program put on by the Diocese of Columbus. Anybody go to the chrism program here? Yeah. Bob, yeah, Bill did. Uh, the chrism program was geared for people to discern what God was calling them to do within the church. And I signed up, and in the fall of that year, we both, Barb and I, uh, began to attend the weekends, Friday night, all day Saturday, and into the evening, and uh, then Sunday morning at St. Teresa's Shrine. It was a two-year program. It was a group of close-knit people from throughout the diocese, and these Christian people began to call me names. And as names I never attributed to myself. Now they were all complimentary names that I did not feel worthy to be called. But it was through this association with these people and how I now looked at my association with God and the Holy Spirit that I felt the call to the diaconate. God is redirecting my life again. But as I investigated the diaconate formation, I found out that the formation process was put on hold by B uh, Bishop Griffin. He was not happy with the formation um, and, and uh, what was going on, so he just held back. He hired Deacon Frank Anarino to head up the diaconate program and to revamp it, and he did. So within a few months after finishing my first year at CHRISM, an article in the Catholic Times again appeared that told a Bishop Griffin reopening of a formation process, different format, different guidance, different director. He gave a date for the men of the diocese who felt called to attend a meeting. And at this first meeting, there was 125 men understand that there's no formation for about four years so these list of men is growing and growing we heard of all that the formation entailed and all this paperwork and documentation that you had to accompany an application and one requirement was I had to have completed the chrism program I'd only been there one year still had a year to go but that didn't bother me because I heard all this qualifications and all and all we had to study and all this and I'm thinking not my I I'll never get through it I've never been to college I haven't picked up a book for decades to read there's no way I can go back and start studying again so at the end of the meeting I they were handing out papers and so forth and I, I went up to Deacon Anarino who had the meeting and and I said, uh, I'm, I'm not going to apply. And uh, I really felt in my heart that God was stepping in there and saying no to me right up front, or at least not now. And uh, I said, I, I'm, I'm not qualified. I still got a year to go in chrism, and I'm not going to get all this paperwork and everything, documentations. And uh, he looked at my name tag, and he says, no, he says, uh, I want you to apply. And I, I said, why? Why go through all this and then you just toss out my, he said, just apply. So I did, I applied. Uh, I don't know how long after that, maybe a month after that, my applications were in and I got a letter back that saying, I want you to return for another meeting. There was 34, 35 men at that meeting. And we all went through three months of testing, from academic to spiritual to psychological. And all through the summer, 
and the week before, or the month before Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, uh, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, excuse me, I'll get it right, uh, received a letter in the mail giving the ones that were accepted into the program, and my name was on it. I was one of, was one of 12 that was accepted into the program. Well, now what was I to do? No college, no schooling for the last 40 years, no books reading. I, I just hadn't used to studying. I just went to my job every day and then came home to my family. That was it. I went to church. So the first thing I did was pray. And I went to the Lord in front of the tabernacle. And I says, God, if you want me to be a deacon, I will be more than happy to do all the work. But you certainly have to be there to help me. You know my intelligence. You know what I can do and what I can't do. And I do need your help. Well, now you know the rest of the story. God did answer my prayers. And the Holy Spirit accompanied me every step of the way of formation and has not left my side since. The first year of formation, first nine months of formation, we had to write 61 papers. And I did it, as did the other 11. But it was only through the help of God and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. February the 1st, 1997, I was ordained by Bishop Griffin to the diaconate. See how God has been good in all my life. He's good. He's good in your life, if we let him. Since I've retired from the diaconate, uh, active diaconate, I still get calls to help. And uh, help in other parishes and Father Don's got me on speed dial. Uh, and I've, I've been asked to preach at, at different masses. Uh, actually, I've been fortunate enough to preach throughout the world. Now, that doesn't mean I'm getting calls from the Pope or anybody else to preach. I happen to be there at the right time with the right priest. Uh, but I'd like to share just a couple places that I have preached. It was very meaningful to me. First of all, when I went back home, Italy in Lopia, the Church of the Assumption there. Uh, it was August the 15th, and the pastor asked me to preach there, Don Giuseppe, and uh, he wanted me to preach, so I did. I, I preached in my home, what I call my home parish, uh, on the Feast of the Assumption, and then he says, I need you to preach this Sunday, too, for a wedding. And I said, I'm going to tag him. <laughs> He says, no, he says in English, he says the bride is from Switzerland, and the, or uh, from Sweden, and he says his, her family doesn't understand Italian, but they do know English, so I, w I did there. Uh, the other really preaching that God blessed me with was, I was with Father Tim Hayes in the Holy Land, and he uh, had scheduled, I don't know how he did it, but he got scheduled to say Mass at the tomb of our Lord, and he asked me to preach that Mass, and that was a, that was a true blessing, true blessing. Uh, I preached at both St. Peter's and St. Paul's outside the wall in Rome. Uh, it's in St. Peter's, it's down in the, the chapels of the popes buried there underneath. Uh, so I've had that. I've recently been asked to preach a couple of times at healing masses at St. Joseph's Cathedral, which is every other month. Uh, but now with that said, I, I want to share where God comes into play in this, the awesome responsibility of preaching. It's not a matter of, uh, and the other deacons and father will tell you the same. These are not words that are coming, that are coming out of my mouth that are coming from up here. The words that are coming out of my mouth is coming from the Lord. Anytime I speak from here, the message is from God, not from me. Uh, the Holy Spirit directs me in all my ways ever since I found him in the early 90s. Uh, my schedule to write a homily begins by reading the scripture, meditating on my life, what is going on in the world, 
and then kneeling down in front of our Eucharistic Lord and praying. And from that, I take notes from my heart. And when returning to my computer, the keys are beneath my fingers, and I think the Holy Spirit is going like this to me. Where did Tia touch? I'm not smart enough, and I'm truly saying this. I'm not trying to be humble. Nor do I believe any of us are qualified to accomplish a daunting task of preaching the Word of God without the direction of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do I know that? I've got some stories to tell that prove that. Uh, give you a recent example that pertains to this talk today, this special gathering that we have of men. I was asked a few months ago to give this talk, and I hesitated and did not give an answer. About a month later, Pat Wesley asked me again, and I again hesitated. And he kind of pushed me a little bit, but I didn't give him an answer. Well, the very next day I went to morning mass. Guess what the scripture reading was about? Jesus sending out of the 72 disciples to the world, missionaries for Christ. And he tells them, do not worry about what you are to say. The Holy Spirit will direct you. So that and similar events throughout my life is how I know what the Lord is asking of me. And that's why I do say that God is good. I want to share a couple other stories that happened to me where I recognized where God was there. First of all, a couple months into my formation at the diaconate, Father Tom Schoenbarger was my pastor. He sponsored me in a diaconate. But he was leaving our parish and he was going to St. Timothy's in Columbus, and he had an annulment that he wanted to complete before he left. So he says, I'm just so busy. He says, would you go do a uh, uh, inter uh, interview? And I says, yeah. So he gave me the name and the papers and all, and, and I called up this lady. She was the mother of the wo woman that was getting an annulment, and I asked her, and she says, sure. She says, uh, I can, but she says, I work evenings. She says, my best time would be about noon. I said, okay, I'll be there at noon. So I told my boss that I was going to be gone for lunch, my lunch period, and I said, I'll probably be a little late getting back. And he was okay with it. So I drove out to Hebron, and on a back road, I found a house, I knocked on the door, this man comes to the door, and being, how can I say this, less than courteous, okay, he invited me in. And there he opened the door. He really didn't invite me in. He just held it open. I took it as an invite. So he yelled at his wife, and his wife came out, and she was very cordial, very nice. I asked the questions. It took 15, 20 minutes, and uh, she answered them all. I says, would you mind signing this paper that I put down your answers right? And she said, oh, it's all right. She read it, and she signed it. And then she excused herself to go back and finish getting ready for work. And I thanked her, and I said, well, I'll be leaving. Going, got to go back to work. And I got up out of my chair, and this man says, just a minute. i got some questions for you. you know, this is the way he talked to me. I says, okay. He says, I was baptized a Catholic, but my parents never went to church, and I never went to a Catholic church. And I want to know the answers to these questions about why the Catholics do this in their liturgies, why they teach this and why they do this, and none of that is in scriptures. And I thought, oh my golly, why are we going here? Seriously, now, I closed my eyes and silently prayed, Lord, send down your spirit to give me answers. So he started. He made me sit down. He started, asked me a question. The answer was there, just like I was a well-versed scripture scholar. The answer was there. So he says, well, that does make sense. And with that, another question. Take a step back and he says, well, you know that does make sense. And he did this for a half hour. 
And every single answer I gave, he would take a short step back and say, well, that makes sense. You can't tell me that God doesn't answer prayers. That was not, not my intellect speaking, but the Holy Spirit. When he had finished, he cordially walked me to the door, shook my hand, and wished me well. Now, I don't know what happened to his faith after that, but I propose that he investigated his relationship with God more closely, and I pray that he found the truth of the faith. I retired from the active diaconate in 2009 when I turned 70. And in 2012, I received a call from the bishop's office asking me to come out, to re out of retirement to help the administration of the parish of St. Anne in Dresden and St. Mary's here. Father Jack was in the hospital. Well, when a man is ordained to the diaconate, you take a vow of obedience to the bishop. And although I didn't feel qualified, I said, okay, I would. And it was going to be for two or three months. The first thing I did was set to prayer because I needed help. I was here for 11 months before Don got here. Yeah. He, he relieved me and took over. And all this that's around here is from Father Don. I know the Lord was with me all the way. I know that. And there were times that I must not have listened to him because I made mistakes. But he redirected me when I needed it. And together with the good people of this community, we made it happen. We got through it all. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, sending the help of retired priests to the diocese and Bishop Campbell himself to administer the sacraments of the Eucharist and reconciliation, I would not have been able to accomplish the task at hand. In the 11 months here, in both this church and in St. Anne's in Dresden, only two times did I have to resort to having a communion service in place of a mass. The retired and active priest of the diocese stepped forward I said yes to God, and he returned the favor and answered my prayers. God is good. God is good. And my last event I want to share where God intervened, intervened with me was recent also. It was Christmas Eve 2017 <clears throat> as I assisted at Mass right here in the sanctuary with Father. Uh, Christmas Eve and the Gloria began, and Boom, I laid on the floor. I fainted. First time in my life. I was urged by an attending doctor to go to the emergency room, but I knew better than he did, so I refused. Uh, no need for that. So upon a scheduled visit to my cardiologist in January uh, and his device clinic, they found it was my heart. And they, in fact, the, the nurse that checked my pacemaker at the time told me the exact time it was that I fell on the floor. Um, as it turned out, it was for my heart had stopped for 42 seconds, what they told me. So I was scheduled for a catheterization uh, within a couple, three days to be checked out. As I came out of the anesthetic, my son, who's a doctor, uh, was there and informed me I wasn't going home. He said, you should not be alive. You're scheduled for open heart surgery bypass tomorrow morning. Turned out that I had a five-way bypass, new valves, you know, all that stuff. Well, my wife notified the diaconate office, and in turn, Deacon Anarino told Father Lump and Bishop Campbell about it. So Father Lump responded immediately. He came to Mount Carmel Hospital from the cathedral I received the sacrament of the sick, reconciliation, the apostolic blessing, and our Eucharistic Lord, my food for the journey. I was ready for the Lord. 
I was at peace that I had never known before in my life. I even told my family goodbye. I did not think I'd make it through. I mean, that was okay. I was fine. I was ready. God had given me that peace, but I guess the Lord wasn't ready for me. Or as the saying goes, God's not ready for you, or the devil doesn't want you. One or the other. <laughs> and to top it off, and I, people can't believe this, but it's true. To this day, which is, what, 19 months later, I have never felt one ounce of pain with my heart right there, or with my heart the surgery. Not one ounce of pain. Now, my legs have been weak, my shoulders have hurt some, but nothing to do with the surgery. And my son, who, the oldest son, who's a doctor, uh, stayed with me all the time. I don't know how long, but I'm knowing him, he was probably there 24 hours a day. I was a Friday that I was operated on, and I remember nothing the following week. And I woke up, conscious woke up, when they put me on a gurney to take me to the nursing home. And when I tell the story that I have had no pain with this, he laughs and laughs. He says, you had so much pain that week, he says, you were born in that room. He took it away from me. I didn't feel it. I didn't feel a bit of it. God took the pain away from me and wouldn't let me have it. Can you believe that? He, he's just... He has more to do, more for me to do, I think, for him. Because every time I turn around and look closely, he's got his hand on my shoulders. He's been such an integral part of my life. And every step I have taken, even those steps that took me down the wrong path of life, he's been there. He's there. He's there for me. Every single move. In St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, third chapter, Paul writes, it is not ourselves that we preach, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts, that we might make known the glory of God on the face of Christ. I pray that through this talk, that you have heard what I have truly said today that you heard it properly. And as I reread this talk, it sounded like I'm tooting my own horn. Far be it from that. There's two kind of words that are on papers. There's adjectives and there's nouns. The nouns is the goodness of God. My life are adjectives describing the goodness of God. That's where the focus of this talk is, the goodness of God. I tell you the story of my life as I recognized it in the graces that was given to me by God. We all have dry spells, and for me, my dry spell period was long, but probably not been as bad as some will tell you they've had. But it doesn't matter to what degree. It's a matter of how it affects us and finding out why we have had them and what we can do to get it back on the right road. We're all unique individuals. In God's eyes, he made us who we are. For me, I can see mine extending from my confirmation at age 13 until 1992 into my 50s. Is God in my life? Absolutely. I just didn't allow the Holy Spirit in. God the Father, Jesus my Savior, was always present, and so was the Holy Spirit. I just didn't recognize nor listen to God's voice in the Spirit speaking to me. God will never abandon any of his children. It is not about me. It's about God's mercy and love. It's not about you, but it's of God's mercy and love in your life. We should always be looking forward, reflecting on the past, how we, re re we treated our relationship with our Almighty Father, how we reverenced His Son, Jesus, 
how we have found the Holy Spirit and allowed our triune God to be that guiding force in our lives, to be the servant of the Lord has called us to be. It is not about us. It is about God, his mercy, and love for each of us. In the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, we read, however, take care and be earnestly on guard not to forget the things that your own eyes have seen nor let them slip from your memory as long as you live, but teach them to your children and to your children's children. It is each of our duty, men, to pass it on, that which will bring our family closer to the Lord. It is our duty to share with our brothers and our sisters in Christ that which will help them on their journey in the Lord. For God is so good, we need to spread the news. A couple of weeks ago, the diocese had the annual diaconate convocation, and Bishop Brennan was there, and he started his talk about being from Long Island and being a Mets fan, and he talked about them celebrating the anniversary of, of them winning the pennant in 1969, and he said, you know, the two years before that, they were eighth place and ninth place. And as they came up to the season starter, the catcher, and I think he said it was uh, Jerry Grody, but I looked it up and I think he was wrong there. But anyway, it was the catcher. He believed, he believed that they could win the pennant. And he came to the team, and not in a pep talks type thing, but in a way that they knew that he really believed. He says, if we believe we can win the pennant, we can do it. And he kept hammering on it, and they laughed at him. Some laughed at him, some of them just ignored him. But as the season began to start, they t the rest of the team, if we believe we can do this, they believed and they did it. They won the pennant. So you and I have to believe in God the Almighty. We have to have it. Our faith has to be strong our hope sincere, our love true, and our prayer life as the Blessed Mother and all the saints in heaven. And in that prayer, we have to daily, continually say yes to our triune God. Pope Francis, in the Gospel of, uh, in a sermon on the Gospel of Luke, was on the Feast of the Annunciation. Uh, he read the chapter, I'm given the homily, he says, there was three difficult moments in Mary's life. The first moment was the birth of Jesus. There's no room for them. They had no house, no dwelling to receive her son. There was no place where she could give birth. Surely she remembered the words of the angel, rejoice, Mary, the Lord is with you. She might well have asked her, where is he now? The second moment, the flight to Egypt. They had to leave to go into the exile. Their lives were in danger. There too, she might well have asked, what happened to all those things promised by the angel? But she didn't. The third moment, Jesus' death on the cross. There can be no more difficult experience for a mother than to witness the death of her child. There too, she might well ask the angel the same thing. What happened to all those good things you promised? Then we see her encouraging and supporting the disciples. We contemplate her life and we feel understood. We feel heard. We can sit down to pray with her and use a common language in the face of the countless situations we encounter each day. We can identify with many situations in our life. We can tell her what is happening in our lives because she understands. Mary is a woman of faith. She's the mother of the church. She believed. Mary is the mother of yes to the Lord. For me, I am his lowly servant, not worthy to be called his servant. But I will continue to try to follow the path the road he's laid out for me. And when I stray from these paths he's given me, I know that he will bring me back around through the detours of life if I let him. 
I pray that on the final day here in this for in this world excuse me I missed a page and I have to read this I pray that on the final day here in this life he will extend his divine mercy his forgiveness and his love so I may enter into his heavenly homeland that's why each of us will get there his mercy his love his forgiveness as my years pass by and I'm no longer as I was even yesterday I prepared my family for the days that are coming that I have spent a long time preparing for and I have written little notes here and there with my desires when I can no longer speak to them one thing I put down is my desire that when I die I want no one to eulogize me for anything I might have done because it wasn't me it was God if my life has not spoken for itself of God within me then no mere words will be remembered anyway in the words of St. Thomas More the night before he was martyred in a letter to his daughter he wrote pray for me I will pray for you and merrily we'll meet in heaven. I pray for each one of you, and I ask you to pray for me, and we will meet in heaven. And may the Lord bless you with his love, grace you with his Son, and guide you with the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For God is good. Always was, always good. And God is really good. Always was, always was. Thank you, gentlemen.